everybody, this is Caitlin Garbett uh, with you live. You cannot see me, but you can see the wonderful Dr. Mandar Jog in front of you. Hello, Dr. Jog. Hello, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I just wanted to let everybody know that I'm thrilled that each and every one of you are able to attend this very important webinar because I know um, our phones have been ringing off the hook because there's been so many questions about our new world regarding COVID-19. And so we're going to make sure that um, Dr. Jog here can uh, help you address those questions. Um, so feel free to ask your questions throughout um, this webinar. And just for those of you who do not know Dr. Jog, I'm happy to uh, introduce him and give you a little bio. He is the director of the National Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence in Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Program at London Health Science Center. He's also a professor of neurology at Western University, both in London, Ontario, Canada. He is also one of the associate directors of the Lawson Health Research Institute. His training in neurology was in Toronto and completed a fellowship in movement disorders with Dr. Anthony Lang, followed by a four-year postdoctoral fellowship in computational neuroscience at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In addition to a large clinical practice, Dr. Drog supervises many masters, PhD and post-secondary doctoral research and clinical fellows in his laboratory. With six patients and or patents and four provisional patents for innovative technology, he is the co-founder of Metro Incorporation and founder of Manjog Enterprises Limited, an MDDT incorporation. Dr. Drog's research attempts to probe the structure and function of the basal ganglia and their role in movement disorders. His research projects on which he has published more than 300, which Dr. Jog, correct me, I'm sure that's a little higher now, <laughs> and given over 300 national and international presentations that focus on technology, speech, gait, and much more. What a bio, I could go on and on, but <laughs> I think it's now time that Dr. Jog talk about um, what is going on in your world and how is COVID affecting uh, Parkinson patients today? Yeah, right, I mean, you know, so um, having, um, uh, such uh, a large effect on clinical practice is probably the first time that uh, something like this has happened to us. We did go through SARS a few years ago where there was a, an impact on how we um, practiced in, in that environment, but obviously this has uh, affected us uh, much more. Um, largely what it has done is that uh, it has uh, uh, unfortunately um, affected our new patient populations the most in terms of clinical uh, assessments, we're not able to see any new patients in the hospital setting, uh, which requires us to uh, have to do a full history and physical examination in person. However, um, in, uh, because of the excellent team that we have uh, uh, here in, in, uh, in my clinic, uh, with my uh, clinical fellows uh, and uh, my um, nurse, uh, Heather, uh, have uh, been extremely diligent and we've been able to actually uh, call everybody. Uh, that, uh, of course, we could get a hold of that were booked for follow-ups in our uh, clinics. Uh, I'm not exactly sure when we began that, but sometime in the middle of March, and we're continuing that on through the end of May. So all patients that are part of our practice uh, that are already uh, on the roster um, and were booked for follow-up uh, have been are, and are being called, so they don't have to actually come into the hospital. So that has changed our practice, obviously, because we're not used to doing only phone call follow-ups. We usually examine patients, and there's, of course, the uh, component of uh, medicine that requires us to have, you know, face-to-face uh, -face communication. However, uh, what it has done, though, is, is hopefully it has given those patients that are uh, part of our practice um, you know, a comfort zone that uh, they're not being abandoned in any way, that we're here, we're here to answer questions, uh, uh, we're manning the phones, and even though we cannot physically see anybody um, in the hospital, we're still here to help in whichever possible way. Out of those phone call patients that we've made, uh, those patients that um, are uh, deemed absolutely urgent, and thankfully there haven't been many, uh, we um, are going to be looking at uh, seeing them. So that's how it has affected our practice in terms of um, um, you know, the direct impact uh, in, in our clinical care, but hopefully in the next couple of months, um, we should be able to get back to some degree of normalcy there. Um, so that's where we're at in my practice anyway. Yeah, that's uh, quite a 
busy time for you to definitely adapt to new ways of doing things. I think all businesses are trying to figure that out, especially in the healthcare system. So um, one of the questions I have from someone is, you know, not being able to get my my drugs and everything, is there a way that another way that they can get their prescriptions for their Parkinson's? So I'm not sure exactly why that is the case, because all pharmacies, I've talked to several pharmacies in the last little while, including our hospital pharmacy, everything is in stock, and there really is no reason why you shouldn't be getting your prescriptions filled in the normal way. Um, there is no reason to go and hoard a year's worth of supplies. I mean, that's not, uh, we wouldn't have prescribed it that way anyway, and, and there's no reason for that to, to do that. At the same time, there's no reason that your pharmacy should be giving out two and three weeks and one month worth of medic medicine. There's no shortage. Uh, as I said, I've talked to the several pharmacies and specifically asked this question even yesterday, and uh, they, they, they have stock. I mean, obviously, if there's a medicine that is a clearly special order or something special has to be done, uh, then that care should be taken to make sure that you're not going to run out. Um, but uh, uh, there really is no reason why you shouldn't be getting your usual three-month prescription renewals for the usual PD medicines. Fair enough, yep. Um, as we move through this long pandemic, do you see an increase in PD cases? If not, what other issues seem to be connected with COVID-19 versus Parkinson's disease patients? Well, that's an interesting question because, you know, um, the number of patients, you have to remember that there's a perspective here. The number of patients that have been affected with COVID-19 is uh, logarithmically less than what actually happened in uh, the late uh, in the early 1900s when the influenza pandemic occurred. And in that influenza pandemic, uh, you know, tens of millions of people were affected. And it did actually cause a very significant encephalitis. In fact, there's a name for that, encephalitis lethargica, which produces uh, post-encephalitic um, Parkinsonism. And there was a, an epidemic of post-encephalitic Parkinsonism that occurred after the influenza virus uh, uh, infections. The numbers of patients is uh, nowhere close to those kinds of magnitudes, even around the planet. At the same time, um, you know, any virus the, or any such uh, inflammatory infectious process can affect the brain. So for example, you know, uh, viral meningitis, um, regular meningitis, viral encephalitis, uh, all of these are um, things that we see all the time in the population and specifically doesn't have anything to do with COVID. Um, Japanese V encephalitis is another common uh, central nervous system uh, infection that can result in post encephalitic Parkinsonism. You have to remember that that is not Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease does not occur because of an infection, as far as we know, um, in, in the uh, usual uh, Parkinson's practice, which is the most common. And that's why we call it idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Now, will uh, COVID uh, related central nervous system infections occur? Yes, they're certainly being reported. Uh, at the same time, you know, it, uh, the, the, the numbers are very small and, and it really doesn't have any predilection for patients who already have Parkinson's disease. So there's really no increased risk of people with Parkinson's disease um, getting infected with uh, the coronavirus. Um, post um, infection, if you do happen to get the illness, then it falls into the same category of somebody that has got a chronic illness or somebody that's elderly, which is usually the case with Parkinson's disease, and uh, then you are at higher risk uh, from having a chronic illness. Patients with Parkinson's disease are not immunocompromised, unlike patients that have, for example, chemotherapy ongoing for something, um, or patients with GI disease that are getting uh, you know, IV immunotherapy. Those people are especially at risk, but uh, patients with Parkinson's disease are not at any higher risk of acquiring uh, uh, COVID. Good to know. Um, another question from someone was saying, um, does having, well, you just said, I guess, that you're not more vulnerable. So I guess another question is, my Parkinson's affects my blood pressure. How might COVID-19 affect me if this is the case? Again, there's absolutely no, obviously we don't have, you know, reliable data on this, but there really is no um, uh, theoretical biological reason why having Parkinson's disease and autonomic dysfunction makes you more vulnerable uh, for acquiring disease such as COVID-19. It'd be no different than people getting any other. Now, because patients uh, with uh, Parkinson's disease can be in environments where you could be 
more likely exposed, such as in a nursing home setting where you have uh, a population uh, that is in very close contact. And you know very well that um, in many nursing homes and retirement facilities from time to time, there are outbreaks of even regular flu. Uh, in fact, recently I was, um, before all of this began, I was supposed to be in a, a place where we, we were treating somebody uh, and uh, there was uh, the, the, the place was locked down because there was a, a flu outbreak. So that's quite uh, well known in such facilities. Uh, and that's why you're seeing that even for the COVID-19 uh, scenario. So yes, if you're in that kind of an environment, then certainly, but then it would be no different than all the uh, standard precautions that you would be taking in that environment anyway. Having Parkinson's specifically or hypertension or Parkinson's with uh, blood pressure fluctuations is again, not a known uh, specifically high risk uh, necessarily for getting the disease. Again, once you have the illness, having a chronic illness uh, such as Parkinson's disease, um, certainly you have to be much more careful. You could have other things such as swallowing difficulties along with it and exercise might be reduced already. So uh, there are those secondary effects that I do want to talk about that can affect patients with Parkinson's disease uh, just because of the fact that what has happened uh, in terms of the community resources available to patients with PD, not specifically because of COVID. Okay, good. Um, what advice do you have for care partners that have PSWs coming into their home to find care? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think that we have to really follow the uh, health unit guidelines for these things. And I, I understand that they're quite uh, varied sometimes and confusing. Um, there are, you know, issues of uh, that PSW potentially or going from one home to another home to another. Uh, I don't have a specific answer to that in terms of having the specific person dedicated to one patient. I don't think that would be potentially practical. Um, at the same time, um, you know, those healthcare providers uh, have a very clear mandate provided by authorities uh, that know far more than me uh, with respect to, you know, contact precautions and all that, that they will be following, presumably. And if they're a reliable agency, uh, the, um, and um, uh, at both ends, the person that's providing the care from outside and the patient and caregiver partner have to be very clear that they meet uh, all the provincial and healthcare guidelines as to distancing and making sure that they're open about the um, symptoms that they may or may not have uh, and all the usual hand washing, et cetera, that are uh, mandated by law and by healthcare agencies. Um, so uh, I, I don't think it probably is practical to have uh, you know, a dedicated healthcare provider that only comes to your home and cannot go anywhere else. That might be a bit difficult to achieve. Um, obviously, the more you keep things in-house, the better it is. The hope is that this is short-lived, that this is going to be, you know, a, a few weeks, maybe a few months, but not longer than that. Uh, and so there are going to be clear hardships there. Um, those things that are not mandatory, for example, um, that, you know, you have somebody coming in once a week to give you some stretching exercises, those kinds of things, I would say, it's not worth doing at all. Things that are clearly not required for maintaining um, you know, quality of life and, and uh, function uh, should be um, deleted at the moment. Um, so the more you can isolate yourself and maintain all of the um, uh, guidelines that the governments have given, the better it is. Fair enough. Um, I am the daughter of an 85-year-old patient who has both vascular dementia and Parkinson's disease. My father just moved into a long-term care home about four months ago, and since his long-term care was locked down, um, he has not been able to make contact with him, and it's very difficult sometimes over the telephone. So therefore, do you have any tips on how to best support someone with Parkinson's and dementia at this challenging time? Well, I mean, again, I think all of the um, healthcare providers in that home are going to be doing the best that they can do, given the restrictions that they may have to provide uh, as much interaction. And finally, uh, even outside of this, the main issue with patients who have cognitive impairment uh, and, um, and, and mobility dysfunction is to have as much of a daily routine as possible. So obviously inside the home, the routine would have changed uh, given what is going on to be able to follow guidelines. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if a new routine, like all of us, in a way, uh, can be achieved, uh, even though it might be restricted, um, that's usually the best uh, thing for a patient with cognitive impairment uh, so that um, there isn't day-to-day -day variability. Most of the time with, with dementia, 
uh, having different things happen on a different day are quite confusing, whether it's the environment, whether it's a location, whether it's medicine. So, you know, giving medicines on, at regular times, making sure that there's consistency, even though it might be reduced or different than before uh, from day to day. Uh, as much as that is possible, I'm sure the people at the Institute are trying to do their best to do that with the given resources that they have. Um, but, uh, I mean, you know, again, this is something that is for potentially, you know, a limited duration of time. And if you can maintain that, uh, that, that distancing and make sure that you're not putting, um, you know, your um, uh, loved one at risk by taking chances of making contact, that is much riskier than having them in an isolation uh, place where there are specialized people giving care, you know. So um, I, I think this is not really, this is more generic advice. Um, than a specific advice, but um, I think we are all restricted with, at this point, what can be done uh, while keeping the most important thing, which is safety and distance uh, from um, vulnerable populations, um, you know, as our primary target uh, to achieve. Perfect. Um, I guess one person was wondering if a PD patient is on a ventilator due to COVID-19, how will they get their Parkinson's medications? Yeah, so that, uh, the, that's a good question. Um, depending on what the medication is, um, the, the most important one that we use being the Vodopa, uh, that can be crushed and given through an, an azogastric tube. Uh, so it's possible to do that. There aren't any intravenous uh, uh, forms and, or injectable forms available in Canada, unfortunately. Uh, there aren't any injectable forms to begin with, but the intramuscular injections of something called apomorphine, for example, is not yet available uh, for everybody to use easily. Uh, in Canada, they are available in the market. Uh, so that is one possibility. Uh, but most of the Parkinson's medications, uh, except for the control release cinnamon, for example, everything can be crushed and given through a nasogastric tube uh, uh, for a period of time anyway. So that, right. that's, uh, that's definitely possible to do. Okay. Um, another one is my husband is prone to urinary tract infections, which have often led to hospitalizations in the past. I really want to avoid the ER in the hospital now because of COVID-19. Is there anything I can do? Um, well, I mean, if, if um, uh, the, there are two ways in which urinary tract infections could manifest. Um, if, the, if your husband is symptomatic, then clearly you know that something has to be done in terms of getting your analysis done. Um, the uh, emergency departments are, uh, you know, very well versed in maintaining all of the guidelines uh, that are given by the ministry. And uh, I would say that if there's a medical need, uh, it is a safe environment. It is not an environment that I would be specifically scared of. Uh, and I wouldn't want any Parkinson patient or any patient in general to take health care into their own hands uh, by being afraid of coming to the emergency department because it is a high risk of getting infection if there are clearly medical reasons that you must come to the emergency department. Um, there are other, uh, you know, uh, places that also, I think um, labs are open outside to get laboratory tests done. I think there are some walk-in clinics that are open as well. So where you can probably get a urinalysis done, um, you know, that, that kind of a thing. Now, if your husband is asymptomatic uh, for the urinary tract infection, then often the only way to detect that something is going on is worsening of Parkinson's disease or hallucinations or something else, which is a secondary symptom. Again, these are worrisome symptoms. The first would be to contact a neurologist or doctor uh, to get advice, like we have um, provided service uh, uh, with um, uh, our uh, clinical nurse, um, Heather, and, and all of our fellows that are available to answer those questions. Um, there's telehealth, of course, available um, potentially. And as I said, um, uh, there are uh, medical facilities open where you can um, be seen and get uh, your analysis done if, uh, if the symptoms are not of urinary tract infection, but something else. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait on uh, medical symptoms if they become worrisome just because of the fear of coming to emerge. I mean, that's what, and they are very well uh, versed and extremely competent uh, in making sure that patients are not uh, inadvertently exposed to unsafe uh, environments. Yeah, and someone did ask about the process that they were to go to ER. Um, is like to avoid going into ER if they think they have it. Is there a separate area for assessments um, to get tested? Yeah, there are a lot. That, so, so yes, I mean, there's a intense screening as per the uh, health units that goes on 
for people that come in. And certainly if anybody at risk is in a different location, people, in fact, even in neurology, we have a special neurology response uh, team and area where somebody doesn't even need to go into the emergency department for, let's say, a bad migraine or something like this. Uh, we can see them completely outside of the emergency department. So all of those things, that I don't know the exact details for all of the other some you know uh, symptoms. I certainly know for our neurology service, uh, our uh, department has been extremely diligent and uh, people have worked extremely hard uh, uh, to try and get, the, not to try and get, but to have put together this uh, emergency response and neurology team. Thankfully, uh, it has not been busy, which is a good thing, uh, but at the same time, the resources are certainly there to avoid any uh, uh, you know, unnecessary contact uh, with uh, infected patients that may be in the eMERGE. And as I said, the emergency room uh, physicians, the, the, the nursing staff and other staff and the powers that be that manage that are extremely well versed in this. And, <coughs> excuse me, let's try. Um, can I just get a glass yeah, of water, thank you. And are very well versed in, um, in uh, taking care of the utmost care. So I wouldn't have any uh, hesitation or doubt that um, the um, the arrangements are exemplary. Okay. Um, my husband has been laid off. He is stressed and convinced suddenly that his increase in dyskinetic movements is related to drugs and wants to play with dosing. I attribute the new issues to stress and anxiety. However, do we best like how do we best support reducing the anxiety right now and not being hyper focused on symptoms? Yeah, I mean, I think something like that is worthwhile giving our office a call or your neurologist, depending on whose patient it is. Obviously, we can't talk to people that are not part of our practice, but um, giving the physician uh, and their support staff a call to talk through this because there's a, there are different levels of anxiety. I mean, some that can be discussed and talked about um, and uh, keep the medication for Parkinson's same. Another level of anxiety might require medication to treat the anxiety during that time. Again, keeping the Parkinson's levels uh, of medication the same. And uh, then it may be a combination of adjustment of medications. If you're, uh, you know, for example, if your routine has become much more sedentary, maybe there are times where the medicines could be reduced. Okay. And, um, and that might be possible uh, also. But I wouldn't do that without medical advice. I mean, I would... Uh, uh, most Parkinson's patients, however, depending on the duration of illness that they've had, are quite good at uh, self-titrating. But what you don't want to do is, fit, is fiddle around with the schedule to the point where then, you know, you've got a, a fairly random dosing schedule that becomes very difficult to manage. Um, <clears throat> but uh, if um, your physicians that have, uh, and uh, a care team that has looked after you has given you some leeway in adjusting your medication as needed, which we often do in many of our patients to some extent, then um, you know there's certainly room for a percentage of uh, adjustment of medications at home simply for reduction in in lifestyle. So you know, just as a joke, I mean, if you're sitting at home not doing very much and watching television, people tend to overeat. Well, then you have to compensate for that and saying that okay, well, then I can also have time to work out, so I'm going to exercise. <laughs> so you know, you, you can do both positives and negatives there. Uh, that is one of the things that I did want to take a couple of minutes to talk about uh, in terms of the fact that many support groups, especially exercise programs and those kinds of things um, are suddenly now not available anymore. Um, you know, daycare, day hospitals or having, you know, morning um, uh, routines uh, that, that somebody might be going to a place to do. I think um, patients have to make really um, sort of important uh, personal effort to try and make sure that they still are active. Um, thankfully, at least this has not happened in the middle of, uh, you know, minus 40 degree winter, uh, where we just cannot have, uh, you know, any chance of uh, at least. So if you have availability of stepping out in your backyard, get some fresh air, um, even standing out there doing standing exercises or something like this, uh, to, to, to make sure that, you know, you're not uh, exposing yourself to anything that's against the policy that's been mandated by government. But at the same time, that you do maintain the level of activity, whether it's at home, there are lots of online free, you know, um, Parkinson's exercise, uh, yoga for Parkinson's, those kind of things available, and that I would try my very best if I were, you know, if you're involved in it, to continue doing those kinds of things. So your level of activity doesn't decrease and, uh, and uh, suddenly, you know, now you're deconditioned. Uh, that is a, a genuine, I would say a fear, but a genuine uh, issue with patients with Parkinson's disease. 
uh, that you have to be very careful to maintain your mobility. Right. No, those, those, uh, those are great tips. Uh, one person has asked, has the worldwide search for a vaccine to defeat COVID-19 um, affected funding to support a PD cure research by taking money away from some programs? <clears throat> Well, I mean, I think that, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, those pots of money, uh, as far as I know, should not be directly affected in the long run. I think there are government programs that have been initiated. Uh, again, I you know I'm uh, it's beyond it's, uh, <laughs> that, that question is far above my pay grade to answer as to what, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, funding agencies are going to be doing. But I do know that uh, we've been asked, just as an example, uh, we had a we have a grant that unfortunately we we couldn't uh, um, say no to we we already kind of commenced that research but uh, um, which uh, you know the, a particular granting agency uh, that suggested that you know we would redirect funds for this year into COVID uh, research as compared to other research not specifically for Parkinson disease but in general for science. And I suppose one can understand because, you know, if, given the amount of resources that are available. However, I think that the resources required for finding a vaccine uh, or that kind of thing, um, governments have different, potentially, but again, the, above my pay grade, but would have different pots of money uh, to, to, to do that kind of work. And I think it would be sort of not moral to stop research in other areas uh, uh, and, and draw that down because you have to remember that research labs are ongoing living organisms. You can't just simply stop research. Uh, I can't suddenly start doing research on COVID vi you know, virus. I, I don't have the know-how, nor do I have a lab structure that will do that. However, I do have people that are hired who are doing research and have to continue on. So you, you can't let... So it, it, I, I don't foresee that it's going to have any significant impact on suddenly now reducing Parkinson's research over any significant length of time. I certainly surely hope not. But again, uh, you know, this is my hope and conjecture uh, and common sense rather than having data for it. But I, I certainly hope not. Yeah, for sure. Um, another question that we have is, if known, how many PD affected people are currently infected by COVID in the world or not in Canada, if you know? I do not have an answer to that. I don't think anybody knows that. Um, As it says, very, very specific. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's impossible to know. Uh, uh, however, I would think that it isn't anything uh, over and above uh, any other elderly person related um, uh, you know, impact. So it's, it's not specifically, that's why I said at the start, PD patients are not uh, at any higher risk of getting the disease. As right. far as we've been told. I mean, that might change in, in the year's mm -hmm. time when people are now going to look back at this whole experience and say, gee, what happened? And you might find subsequently that actually, uh, as we're finding people that have maybe hypertension or stroke or something else, were in fact more likely. And that will be a public health and epidemiology uh, data sets probably to be looked at for the next few years to come. Yeah, that's going to be a while for sure. Um, a person was wondering, how are you and your staff protecting yourself from being infected by this coronavirus? Oh, well, I mean, you know, um, we are following exactly all the guidelines that uh, our hospital, um, uh, you know, powers that be and uh, the Ministry of Health. Uh, uh, and, and to a large extent, we're not actually, you know, exposed to any patients at all because all the clinics have been canceled. So all of our follow-ups have been on uh, on on the phone. So virus doesn't travel up telephone lines. So we are. Uh, but when we come into the hospital, there are you know strict protocols that uh, the hospital has initiated as they uh, you know their due diligence very nicely. So we're all screened and you know we we uh, yeah. So the exposure is minimal in in the hospital for us. Thankfully, that's very kind of whoever asked that question. But uh, yeah, perfect. Um, question was, many hospitals are limiting surgeries to urgent cases only. With PD who have DBS stimulation or they require bowel replacement during this health crisis, um, there may be anxiety probed by this. So what should a person with DBS do or someone who has already started going through assessments to actually have DBS surgery? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there are several questions buried in that one. 
Uh, the first one is those people that already have had DBS. Uh, obviously, uh, they will have a very specialized neurologist uh, uh, in our center, um, myself and my team, uh, and uh, my um, uh, colleague, um, Dr. Jenkins, uh, both um, uh, our, our teams are um, you know, involved in, in DBS. And uh, I can certainly answer for uh, our group of patients. Uh, all of our DBS patients have been, uh, that were booked have been phoned, booked in our uh, actual clinic have been phoned, but our phone lines are open for people to call. Uh, it is obviously difficult for us to do our extensive and exhaustive checks online, but um, which is part two of this answer. Uh, all patients with DBS have their own little device that they can monitor. And really the only thing that uh, if patients are already stable on their DBS device that you have to worry about is the battery. And it's a very clear indicator on the, on the device that they carry that the battery is good and it says, okay, and then that's it. I mean, you don't need to really do anything. Um, if there are questions, again, we're available to answer that, and we can certainly guide the um, uh, person through checking their device at home, making sure that it's uh, working. Uh, the third part of it is if the battery is indeed running out or has run out, uh, then that is considered an, uh, an emergency, and uh, uh, we're doing our best to get these people um, have their battery replaced. Thankfully, we've not had uh, uh, really any extensive um, a need to do that, uh, but the operating room is certainly open uh, for having uh, patients uh, have battery replacement, and we, you know, uh, our teams are very much on top of that. Finally, those patients that are uh, that are going through DBS assessment and screening, um, I think that in the large scheme of things, it is an elective procedure, although it has a clear impact on quality of life, and so I would say it's safe to just wait it out uh, to, for a few months till all of this kind of ends where we can go back and resume uh, uh, putting in the DBS device because it is not something um, that is the same as a dying battery. Um, you know, PD patients are on oral medications and uh, the workup is not uh, something that happens in one day and then you're, you're in the OR the next day. It takes months anyway. So yes, it is frustrating because if you're through the process and you're waiting to have surgery not got canceled, there's no doubt that it's frustrating, but it's safer to be away from a place where potentially uh, you could get exposed and be in self-isolation and follow all of the ministry guidelines, which is why they've done this. It's not from just being callous, you know, uh, it's for protection that, uh, that these procedures are indeed uh, to some extent, uh, um, you know, elective um, procedures and we could wait a few months. So um, it is not going to cause any tremendous harm to the patient with Parkinson's disease that's awaiting DBS. So I would say it's safer to wait than to, to get it uh, done uh, at this point in time. But everything will go back onto the track. Obviously, things will be delayed. No one knows exactly um, you know, how we're going to make up for some of these kinds of things uh, which require space, like an OR, uh, to get done in, in, in terms of backlog and who gets done, whether it's a hip surgery that gets done versus a DBS. I must say, again, that's also about my pay grade to answer <laughs> at this point in time. <laughs> But um, uh, but I guess you know that that those will be the questions in the coming few months once this is all over uh, to answer. Um, but I'm sure that uh, you know, there are people in the admin uh, who are going to be having to to face these, and I'm sure they'll come up with uh, innovative solutions. <clears throat> For sure. Um, and going off of just feeling safe and secure, uh, one person is a nurse, and her husband's 71 and has moderate PD, so he does not need too much home support. But she's wondering, she's seen a lot of people, um, I guess, live in hotels or they try to live separately from their loved ones. Would you recommend her doing that? Not at this point in time. I mean, I think uh, if this person is a healthcare provider, they should be screened on a regular basis uh, for, I mean, all of us go home to our families uh, in environments where we're potentially going to get exposed to outside of COVID. I mean, you know, in fact, this has raised awareness, but, you know, we, we are exposed day in and day out to people that um, we never screen. I mean, who knows what most of our patients that we are seeing on a daily basis. I mean, um, many times in clinics, we're seeing between 30 and 40 uh, patients per day. And uh, we, we, we don't know where they've been, what they've been exposed to. So we take this uh, home with us every day. Sure, our um, home uh, environment may not include uh, sick patients, but many patients, many people do have uh, family members that are elderly at home at all times. 
So I wouldn't say that just having this COVID uh, uh, as a uh, current uh, issue uh, should change your normal habits of hygiene, of washing hands, and and you know maybe changing your clothes when you go home, etc. This is brought to the forefront that something like this should be done on a routine basis. Um, but uh, that healthcare provider is probably being exposed to all kinds of things on a regular basis in the environments that they're in uh, as it is. So if they follow all the health um, regulatory guidelines of making sure they're washing their hands and, and the, if they're we're having to wear a mask, they wear a mask or whatever it is that they have to do um, and making sure that they're tracking their own health, that they're not getting sick or anything like this, maybe a little more vigilant. Uh, I don't see any particular reason why uh, a care partner should stay in a hotel uh, if they're going to continue to, con to work because that, that, that doesn't seem like a practical option. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, someone was asking, and I'm not sure if it's a question that, you know, pro or con, but a person with PD that has no health issues, who would be more at risk? Someone with diabetes, heart disease, or lung problems versus someone directly with the disease? Well, a person with Parkinson's disease is not at any higher risk of acquiring it. Now, if you have multiple other illnesses, you're at risk of having more complicated uh, clinical condition anyway. So if you've got diabetes, hypertension, uh, and pulmonary disease, or one or the other, uh, you're going to be at higher risk uh, for other illnesses anyway. Um, there are data, again, uh, this, you have to remember this is not my field. I'm not an infectious disease person. Uh, so um, it, it, there are, I think, data that are showing that patients who have hypertension may be at higher risk of getting a more complex form of disease. Obviously, you've got another lung disease and you get a pneumonia. Uh, let's say you've got emphysema uh, from smoking and then you get um, uh, the, an infection that is pulmonary. It doesn't matter which one it is. It could be just a regular pneumonia. Uh, you're at obviously much higher risk of getting complications. Uh, so um, the, the I don't think it's possible, at least I don't know this, uh, to be able to give numbers of saying somebody with hypertension is 18% more likely and somebody with this is 22%. I think that data is not available yet. Uh, and the populations are too much in flux. This may be possible next year once the data is collected or maybe later on in the year once the uh, public health people are able to give clear guidelines. Uh, I'm not aware of actually giving anybody such guidelines personally. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, someone, you, were, you said pneumonia, but the vaccine, would it protect them a little bit more from COVID if they were to get it? The, the, the what screen? The pneumonia the vaccine. vaccine. Yeah. Oh, the, no, no, not pneumonia vaccine. It is not a, it is not a vi virus. Um, mm -hmm. Pneumovax is a, di a different thing. I was uh, talking about the flu vaccine. Um, yes, I mean, I think the, uh, the family is the same, but there isn't a specific vi a vaccine, obviously, as you know, uh, for this particular variant. I mean, they, they belong to the uh, family of coronaviruses, and corona, uh, as you may know, stands for crown. And so these viruses have these things sticking out of them that allow them to attach to membranes and whatnot. That's why they're called coronaviridae. You know, the viruses that belong to this class. And uh, again, I'm not an ID person, so to give into any more details won't quote me on that, but multiple viruses in the, uh, including SARS, have the kind of uh, crown-like projections that they bind to, but they're different. And so you wouldn't have one flu vaccine protect against every flu vaccine, as you know, uh, which is one of the things people have doubted about the efficacy of the flu vaccine in general that it may be that today's flu you are protected with, but the next year's version of the virus. Um, but still, at least you have reasonable protection. Uh, so when the vaccine does come out uh, specifically for this corona variant, uh, it will be protective potentially, hopefully, for the corona variant. Now, the virus mutates and comes up with, you know, coronavirus type 2, type 3, type N, type 95, then those viruses may have a requirement for variations. And um, that's one of the problems with the common cold, right? There are so many variations of that virus that you cannot come up with a vaccine for the common cold because if the virus mutates, thankfully it's usually benign, uh, except for a cold. And that's why we've not been able to vaccinate against the, the very simple thing like the common cold because the, the virus changes its shape. So uh, it's like having a different wardrobe uh, 
uh, every day. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now, there also has been some uh, news announcements and a few research articles about um, ibuprofen, just saying if it, uh, it does not work if you have COVID symptoms. Well, in your medical expertise, would you agree? Or is it still safe to take it? Ibuprofen? Yeah. Yeah, again, I mean, there has been, there have been literature on, on it. There has been literature on it. Again, um, the uh, knowledge and interactions uh, of, th this is one of the problems with, um, uh, with over-information because, you see, the, just because we have a lot of capability of getting information now doesn't mean that that information is reliable. The error margin between what the information is and so what we call sensitivity and specificity uh, of uh, when we do talk about different kinds of statistics, uh, you have to be clear whether the volume of data that indicates that is not a suggestion versus something that actually is causative or proven. And the more factors you add in, the more the error multiplies in the information. So you, if you add a patient who's got Parkinson's, Parkinson's with hypertension, Parkinson's hypertension, patient gets COVID, and then you take ibuprofen with it. There are so many variables in that that it would be very hard to predict exactly whether that person should or shouldn't take it. And <clears throat> again, uh, I have had no experience in treating patients with COVID to be able to say ibuprofen should be taken or not. Uh, but you're right, the, the literature is, again, there's some emerging literature on this thing uh, just like chloroquine and treatment with hydroxychloroquine uh, literature. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think that it's possible, uh, at least with my knowledge base, uh, to give advice on whether somebody should be not taking ibuprofen or should be taking ibuprofen. Uh, I think that uh, if you are somebody that has uh, COVID-19, you're positive, you're symptomatic, then the um, people that are giving uh, treatment for this would be the ones to ask for advice on something like this. I wouldn't hypothetically just uh, conjecture on it because those people would be most up to date on uh, the therapy uh, of this condition uh, when it is actually currently happening to the patient. Certainly, for sure. Um, so just a general question for going out in the public. There's been also some news saying that, um, you know, from nursing teams that post on social media saying, you don't have to wear a mask or you don't have to wear gloves when you go to the grocery store. Um, and I know there's cross-contamination issues, but uh, any advice about those who still yeah. can go out in public when they do that? Yeah, so I mean, I think the mask is really not to protect you. A mask is to protect a uh, projection of what uh, you are potentially breathing out onto other things. And so um, if you think that the mask is going to protect you from because these are standard masks that you're wearing. They're not medical grade masks that many of these people are, are wearing that have specific uh, you know, viral load already tested and that kind of a thing. So um, yeah, if, if you feel that um, having a mask is um, something that makes you feel better, I think that's reasonable. Obviously, if you're symptomatic, that's a totally different thing. Um, you, know, you should be following far different guidelines for that. Uh, wearing gloves while grocery shopping, I don't think there's any mandate, to, as far as I know, uh, to doing that. Um, I don't. I do grocery shopping whenever I need to, and uh, I, I, I've worn neither a mask nor uh, um, nor gloves. And I certainly wouldn't be washing fruits and vegetables and, and Lysol or soap or something like this. I don't think there's any requirement for doing that. Um, <clears throat> right? And so... Uh, I think what uh, the, the, the simple common sense things, wash your hands, uh, you know, uh, whenever you've touched a foreign surface, wash them if it's every 15, 20 minutes, do that. Uh, if you have hand sanitizer, use that as much as common sense as possible um, and uh, maintain social distancing. If you're symptomatic of anything, make sure that you uh, get taken care of. These are all the things that are probably going to help you 95% of the time, if not more. That's why the health units are recommending those kinds of things rather than specifically people having to wear uh, for regular day-to-day -day wear gloves and things like that. I, I don't think there are any recommendations to, to do that at this point in time in grocery stores. For sure. Uh, just letting everyone know, we have time for one more question after this. But um, one gentleman is asking, what is your team's website if we need to ask questions in the coming weeks or optionally your office phone number? in the university um, hospital. 
<clears throat> yeah, so we don't actually have a, a, a web-based um, service that we're answering questions like a chat line or something like that. It's not secure uh, to do that uh, ourselves. And I don't think the hospital actually, as far as I know, has that available for all the physicians that are here. Our office phone line uh, is uh, uh, 519-663-3814. Uh, and you can leave a message. Um, and uh, for our patients, you can also call uh, our clinic nurse, um, Heather Russell, and she's here every day. Uh, and we're all around every day. And uh, her number is 519, sorry, yeah, 519-685-8500, and extension is 35311. Uh, but this is for uh, patients that are part of our practice. Uh, we obviously cannot answer questions for people that we have not seen because that's not... Uh, something we can do, um, you know, legally. Absolutely. Um, another question, I guess, is um, often they say 14 days if you have it or if you come back from traveling internationally, uh, even now province-wide. But some people have said that they've seen um, the news where someone would be off 14 days and they go back a couple of days later and then they test positive again. And so this COVID, it seems like it goes in and out where one day they're negative and then a couple of days later they're positive. Can you explain why that could be? Again, beyond my pay grade to answer with respect to the testing <laughs> kit and whatnot, because again, it's an infectious disease question, nothing to do with Parkinson's disease. Uh, however, uh, obviously, you know, the sensitivity and specificity that I talked about in another context is important for every test. And so many times in medicine in general, uh, if we find something that is uh, uh, suspicious or whatnot, we often repeat the test uh, to say, okay, yes, uh, this person clearly has uh, such and such. And uh, when it comes to this kind of testing, uh, I'm not aware, unfortunately, of the uh, specificity and sensitivity of the currently available test kits. Um, but it is possible that if it is less than 100%, as you can imagine, then you may test uh, uh, you know, differently. Uh, so if there's any doubt, uh, then it is uh, certainly worth repeating. Um, but again, that's just generic advice. I must say, I I I don't know the specifics of the testing uh, kits out there, just beyond my uh, my expertise. For sure, uh, it doesn't seem like we have more questions at this time. Okay. Um, but I want to just say to everybody, if you do continue to have questions, please do not hesitate to email me. Um, if you've been following us on our Facebook page or Instagram account, you can often see uh, some updates about what we're doing as an organization. Uh, we do often engage with Dr. Jog, so if there are any outstanding questions, I'm sure I can ask Dr. Jog quick if he's available. For sure. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, we have much yeah. more free time than we normally do, so uh, <laughs> I think, uh, we're, we're here to help in whichever way we can. And again, uh, unfortunately, I can't answer questions that are specific to the infectious process and the, the disease of COVID because I don't treat that and know about testing and, and those kind of things. But, uh, you know, there's enough, uh, I would go to reliable sites such as the Ministry of Health, the London Middlesex Health Unit, and those people will have what is currently the most, um, you know, advisable thing for a patient or um, not, not for a patient to Parkinson's, but specifically for people to do uh, as what is being mandated rather than hearing it from me because the, that, that would be incorrect on my part. Uh, as to, uh, and again, to sum up with respect to Parkinson's disease, uh, clearly, um, you know, the, the, you should continue doing as much activity as you can uh, in a safe environment. Uh, there isn't anything specific that you have to be careful of as having with Parkinson's disease in getting the disease. Uh, obviously, um, take care of everything that uh, is required. If you do feel you're symptomatic, don't hesitate. And we're always here to help uh, answer questions, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whenever uh, uh, they come up. Uh, and I'm sure uh, whoever your neurologists or physicians are outside of our practice that are, um, you know, uh, involved in your care, uh, hopefully also have similar, um, and I'm sure they probably do, uh, help uh, available. For sure. No, the, it's all great advice. So, uh, Dr. Jaw, we think the world of you. So, I, our whole entire Parkinson's community is so deeply grateful to have you. And we do appreciate everything that you're doing, considering that you are a healthcare professional. So, you're a very big inspiration for everybody. So, thank you. Um, closing out, I just want to let everyone know that even though we're all far and these times seem challenging, 
there is always hope around the corner. Um, if anyone has not listened to the Queen's speech, uh, which was a few days ago, she is the highest monarchy. And I read something about how she's been through so much in the world and she's seen a lot. And this is just another part in the world that we're going to get through. And together we will get through this. So always know there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And Parkinson Society Southwest Ontario is always here for you. Don't ever hesitate to pick up that 1-888-851-7376 and dial that number. Even though we're working remotely, every single person is, uh, we're still working and we will answer any calls or questions that you have. Um, and please keep an eye out on our Facebook and Instagram page. We have so many webinars coming up. I really strongly um, encourage you to sign up for those webinars as they're a wealth of information. Um, there's really not more I can say except uh, nobody is alone. We're all facing the same thing, right? So absolutely. Um, yeah, so thank you to everybody and thank you Dr. Jog. Um, we look forward to seeing you all at the end of all of this because again, there will be an end, so. <laughs> we'll see you all on the other side soon. Take care. Absolutely. Happy Easter. Bye-bye. Happy Easter, everybody.